Well, here we are and welcome. It's our neighborhood. I'm Mary Davidson and I have, I have, you know, I never seem to run out of wonderful neighbors to introduce you to. And today, uh, Phil Dixon is with us. And Phil, I said, you know, I don't know how you have time to do a regular job because Phil has taken it as a life's work and a crusade to acquaint people with um, African Americans in sports. And he writes about all kinds of people, but what we're going to talk about today is the African, in fact, you're writing a book on somebody that... You know, Dizzy Dean. Dizzy right Dean, <laughs> that's right. And, but Phil has written um, about black baseball, and which I think is just such a fascinating subject. So we're going to stick to that subject right. because we don't have six days to discuss your your <laughs> life's work, Phil. But he's written um, lots of books. This one is about uh, Rube Foster, and we're going to talk about him a little bit later. But well, you can say something. There he is, Rube yeah. Foster. What? Why did you write a book about Rube Foster? Well, you know, I think Andrew Rube Foster was one of the the real geniuses. In, in the baseball world. And uh, I felt he never got enough recognition. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, even when they put him in the Hall of Fame, they put him in as a, as a manager. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was a tremendous baseball player. One year he won 52 ball games. And he pitched year round to get that total. And he was just a great uh, athlete. You know, he was a big man at the time. Tall or uh, just big? He was big. Mm -hmm. he, he weighed close to 275 pounds which was you and know, he massive that. for a man around That's the turn of the century. Oh, yeah. And he lugged that around the bases? And he was just as agile as could be. And <laughs> uh, he stole bases even at that weight. But uh, he come into town, and uh, they see him pitching. And th they, would, they would wonder how this guy is going to get anybody out. <clears throat> and at the end of the game, they were wondering why they didn't get a hit. <laughs> this one's kind of interesting too. This is about the Kansas City Baseball Trivia Quiz Book about the Royals, the Monarchs, the Athletics, the Blues, and more. Mm -hmm. And there's a, do you collect baseball memorabilia? Oh, absolutely. I started off as a kid collecting baseball cards. Matter of fact, the uh, first article ever written about me was written back in 1977, and it was about my 50,000 baseball cards that oh. I had. Back in those days, you had oh. to buy them in the pack. Yes. You can go and buy the entire set, so yes. you can imagine how much gum I probably <laughs> chewed to get oh those. Oh boy! 50, I hope you have good teeth. <laughs> All that sugary gum. <laughs> well, the 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 bottom line here is that for more than 30 years, Phil Dixon has recorded African American sports topics, and he knows an awful lot of people, and he is the go-to person if you have any questions about the African American as. They were he's mostly mm -hmm. at that time, um, entered yeah. and participated in sports. He's won some awards. The Casey Award for the Best Baseball Book in 1992, mm -hmm. and the Sabre McMillan Award for Excellence in Historical Research. And this is my favorite one, the Spitball Award for Baseball Journalism. <laughs> I love that. That's a good title. Yes. Um, how do you do your, where do you do your research? How do you do it? Because I think that's sort of interesting. Well, you know, uh, the way people do research has really changed over the years. Um, back, uh, say, starting around the late 70s or early 80s when I started, I would go to the library and I'd just go through the microfilm. And then I'd, in the library, loan microfilm from other libraries. And uh, so, uh, and then when I would travel, uh, I would go and uh, go to those cities and use the microfilm as well. So. Microfilm was the thing, and uh, and back in those days, uh, we wanted to do genealogy, especially around 1970s. I can only do genealogy um, in the census up to 1910, and so uh, a lot of this I had to figure out through actually interviewing people. So I probably interviewed over 500 people. You've met a lot of nice people. Oh my goodness! If you know, um, if I could go back and talk about some of the people that I met. They really changed my life. Uh-oh, there's another them, book coming. You know, <laughs> well, you know, uh, my wife has been telling me, you need to write one about the interviews and because I taped a lot of them. She's and, right. Uh, so. Got to listen to the women here. They're, we're trying to get you on the right track here. <laughs> well, you know, you know, interesting thing. Uh, uh, years ago, I was in the home of James Cool Papa Bell, uh -huh. and uh, I was working on my Negro League book, and his wife said, why don't you ever talk about the wives. So we've been married for almost 50 years. And, and 
and I had thought about the stories she would tell me, which were different than the stories he would tell I'm me. I'm sure. And I said, she's on to something. So uh, in my uh, second book, The Negro Baseball Leagues of Photographic History, uh -huh. you see a lot of wives. Good. That's absolutely good. <laughs> you know, this is something that I, I, I didn't ever realize, but you talk about the pioneers of Negro League Baseball, uh, 1865 to the early 1900s, mm -hmm. and that the small towns in Missouri and Kansas, pre-Jackie Robinson, oh, yes. pre-Jackie Robinson, talk about, you talk about they played a role in integrating, integrating baseball, both at the university and professionally. Mm -hmm. Could discuss that a little, because I don't think people, they see baseball integrating with Jackie Robinson. Yeah. But you say that's not exactly the case. Yeah, you know, uh, when I first started uh, doing research, you know, reading the books and things, um, all of the uh, African American baseball history, for the most part, started with Jackie Robinson. And I think there might have been a couple of books out at that time that kind of tried to go beyond you know, or before Jackie. But everything started with Jackie. And then the other thing that I noticed that I was going to change is the fact that when they talked about the black teams, it was only from like the Kansas City or St. Louis or Chicago. And all these other places were left out that I was finding information. So I said, okay, I'm going to talk about that. Then the other thing was they only talked about a few individuals. So they would talk about Satchel Page or Josh Gibson. But I knew from playing baseball that one man doesn't make a team. And so I began to talk about those other players. And if there's any uh, lasting impact I've had, it's affecting those three things. And many people have capitalized on it and began to go into those histories now. But uh, when I first started, uh, it, it was like, uh, it was a dream to change all of that because they saw black baseball as just one in one dimension. And so uh, people like Buck O'Neill, uh, Chet Brewer, who played with the Kansas City Marks, Ruth Foster's relatives, Jane Coop, Papa Bell. I can go on and on. They helped me to change that Well, image. and you did this from more than your interest in the game of baseball. You did it because you felt that um, diversity was not being recognized as a problem, and, um, and you made the remark that baseball is for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, um, one of the things that bleeds through all of my history is diversity. And uh, even when I tour, I like to go and talk about diversity. A, a good example is the Kansas City Monarchs. They introduced the night baseball in 1930. They carried their own lights. They, they did, J.L. Wilkinson. But guess what he did in 1929? Haskell Indian College in, in Lawrence had uh, started playing night football. So. Uh, he wanted to know if this night baseball would really work. So he went to Haskell College and had the Monarchs work out on the base on the football diamond, and then he knew it would work. And and that's diversity. When you think of night baseball, you don't think of Haskell Indian College unless well, someone you tells don't you think about of black it. baseball either. That's that's a correct. And so these are the things I've tried to educate people on to let people know that all of this history it wasn't done you know in some isolated place. It was done in cities all over America and. The other thing, small towns. The, without Kansas, the state of Kansas, you would have probably never heard of the Kansas City Monarchs. Would you believe from 1920 to 19, I say maybe 1959, the Monarchs played the equivalent of maybe 365 games in the state of Kansas. And they traveled. That's, they, they, they traveled. Yeah, they did. And yeah. those games were important because they really uh, provided the income needed for the Monarchs to later on go on and play Ebbets Field and Yankee Stadium. But without Kansas, especially in the early years, and places in Missouri, it would have never happened. Well, you, you mentioned the year 1920, and that was about the time that J.L. Wilkinson became associated with the Monarchs. Mm -hmm. And he drew players from all nations and from the Infantry Wreckers, which was a, um, an Army baseball team. Right. So I think that's interesting too. And these were black players for the Monarchs. That's right. And um, so that I think is, J.L. Wilkinson was Caucasian. That's right. And he, you know, he was a beautiful man. And in that he saw integration differently. 
And even when he started his team, the All Nations, he believed that all nationalities should be playing on the same team. So he got Jose Mendez, he got um, John Donaldson, uh, he got the different white players and, and Italian players, and they, and they put them all on one team. And it had never been done to that degree. And J.L. Wilkinson did this. It was a very radical idea. They couldn't travel on the train together. He had to get a separate Pullman car. But he believed in that. And, you know, some of the players in later years, uh, they would talk about J.L. Wilkinson, and they called him a prince of a man. And I remember uh, George Giles saying to me, he said that he felt that J.L. Wilkinson was the only white guy he ever met in his entire life that didn't have one ounce of prejudice. Yeah. Well, and you know, I also read about him that he, when he would travel with the monarchs, which at that time were all African American, mm -hmm. he would, they couldn't, it was segregated, but he stayed with his team. Oh, sure, I sure. I mean, he didn't, and I, you know, you have to say, he was um, a man for all seasons, and we need more of them. Right now. We do, <laughs> okay. we do. Let's talk about some of these names that aren't on the tip of anybody's tongue. Dobie Moore, mm. Heavy Johnson, George Carr, Hurley McNair, Rube Curry, Cliff Bell. Talk about some of those people. Well, you know, uh, let me see if I can regionalize it a little okay, bit. Okay, okay. You know, um, George Carr. Okay. Uh, he was originally uh, from Los Angeles. Uh -huh. After he finished playing ball, he worked uh, for the railroad. Mm -hmm. And would you believe he died in McPherson, Kansas? Did he really? Yes. Um, uh, let's see, who else did you mention there? Heavy Johnson. Heavy Johnson. I always like to tell people that he was the greatest thing to come from a uh, Atchison, Kansas, next to Amelia Earhart. <laughs> he was a premier slugger, yeah. you know, um, Babe Ruth came to uh, Kansas City in 1922 before uh -huh. the game. Uh, he was hitting home runs out of the park and everything. Uh -huh. But uh, during the game, Babe didn't hit any. But Babe got up to pitch, and Heavy Johnson hit one off of Babe and uh, over at Old Association Park. So, uh, But just, you know, once again, a Kansan, a Kansan by birth. And uh, so I've had a chance to go back to his hometown as well. See, that's really mm -hmm. good to know, mm -hmm. I, I think. That makes, that makes me proud. I'm sure it makes other Kansans proud as well. Oh, yes. What kind of money did these guys make? Well, they didn't make a lot of money. <laughs> and that caused people like Bullet Rogan and some of the better ball players, Frank Duncan, those guys, they had to play year round. And so they would play their season in America, and then they would go down, and especially in the early 20s and the teens, going back maybe around to 1903, they would go to Cuba. Later on, like in 1938, the Puerto Rican Winter League started having uh, African-American ballplayers. Interesting thing, in Puerto Rico, 1938, they could have three Americans on every team, mm -hmm. and they could get any Americans they wanted, but they only wanted black Americans because they knew they were hungry. And they said, when we get guys from the big leagues, they're going to come down and, and relax. <laughs> so they wanted hungry guys. <laughs> they and these guys, hungry guys. They needed the money, so they went to Puerto Rico, and you know, the rest is history. Well, it, it occurs to me that as I read, getting ready to talk to you, that in 1923, when Jose Mendez became the manager, things started to happen for the monarch. Yeah, M Mendez, you know, what an interesting fact about Mendez, you know, uh, Wilkinson has Mendez as the manager of the Kansas City Monarchs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're in the Negro Major Leagues. Mm -hmm. And uh, that itself is an innovation because, would you believe, the Major Leagues didn't have a Cuban manager until the 1930s. So Wilkinson was far ahead in just having Jose Mendez as the manager. And uh, so I had a chance to actually talk to several players uh, Chet Brewer, one who mm -hmm. uh, played for Mendez, mm -hmm. and uh, he said Mendez was a, a real particular kind of guy, but he wanted to train his young guys, and so he would talk about when you take a shower, make sure that you dry between your toes so you don't get, you know, athlete's foot and things <laughs> like that. But he was a <laughs> tremendous strategist and just had been a great, great player, one of the all-time greats from Cuba. This is it. This is the, now, th this is wool. This was, was there, were their uniforms wool? Oh, absolutely. Boy, that's hot. Yeah, you know, uh, you, you, you know, you had to love the baseball game. <laughs> yeah, that's a 1930s version of the Kansas City Monarchs uniform. And this is, you, you get all dressed up. Why a number five? Well, you know, uh, actually, I'm not sure why they put five on that particular uniform. Uh, you know, at one time, you know, uh, baseball didn't have numbers at all. 
And, um, and even with the monarchs, when they got numbers, they would change numbers every year. And would you believe this, in the 1950s, uh, this was Tom Baird, he decided to move away from numbers and he used alphabets for a couple of seasons. So It had no particular connection with their name? No, no, it, no, just uh, whatever alphabet you want it to be. And <laughs> no, so, that's good. but it was just a different way. Well, talk about, Sa everybody knows about Satchel Page, and we were talking, uh, we decided that by the time he <coughs> quit baseball, he must have been 50 years, he wasn't telling, but he must have been 50. Yeah, no, he, he, he definitely was uh, uh, the oldest baseball player, actually he mm -hmm. was the oldest rookie when he came up in 1948, and then he when he retired in 1965, when he pitched those last three innings for the Kansas City Monarchs, he was 59 years old. He was 59. And, and oh I said my. Kansas City Monarchs, I mean Kansas City A's. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Finley bought him back. He was 59 years old. And uh, he still was able to get those guys out. But what's interesting about uh, Satchel Page, and a lot of people don't know this, you know, from the time he left the St. Louis Browns in the early 1950s, he never stopped pitching. And he pitched all around Canada and, and through Kansas. And matter of fact, uh, I was in some line and they talked about him pitching down there for a whole entire season. All these great stories out there. I went to Canada and I bet you I ran into 30 people who played with Satchel Page as late as the 1960s. So when he came back and played with Charlie Finley's A's, he never had a break. He was pitching all the well, way. Well, and I'll bet you that in his heyday, he didn't have ice to soak his arm in and a a tub to take it, relieve his sore muscles. He just pitched and went to the next town. Yeah, and you know, uh, Satchel got smart in later years because whenever the Monarchs played in Satchel, you know, he got uh, articles in Life Magazine and Look Magazine and, and those are big publications at the time. So whenever the Monarchs played, people wanted to see Satchel. And so he was supposed to, they were thinking he was going to pitch every night. So he'd come out and pitch one or two or three innings. And that, and sometimes just one inning, just go sit down because he was the he drawing was, card. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me why Satchel Page called Buck O'Neill Nancy. Well, you know, it's a story. Buck always liked to tell that story <laughs> and uh, about they were rooming somewhere and, and uh, Satchel had someone in the room that was other than his wife. Yes. And then his wife showed up. Yes. And uh, Buck saw her coming. So, um, uh, some some kind of way Buck ended up saying, is that you, Nancy? <laughs> and uh, so they kept the nickname going uh, for years Because Satchel later. Page always called Buck O'Neill Nancy. Mm. And you know, Satchel nicknamed everybody. Did he? Yeah, he nicknamed everybody, opposing batters. And, and you know, the, some of the funny stories I like to tell about Satchel, uh, you know, he he had a habit of being late most uh -huh. everywhere you go. And he had lots of speeding tickets. I was interviewing a guy named Je uh, Jesse Williams, mm -hmm. and he said they were out in California, mm -hmm. and many people didn't see photographs of these African American ball players, and they didn't really know their full names, you know, like like you might know some of the major leaguers. Mm -hmm. So he said the police stopped them out in California, and uh, Satchel was speeding, and he saw his license said Leroy Page, and the officer said, "Are you any kin to that Satchel Page?" <laughs> he said, "No, sir, I'm not kin to him." He <laughs> said, "If he ever comes out here, we've got tickets galore. Now we're going to arrest him." <laughs> so, but, so but he, they, he wiggled out of that. Yeah, one. <laughs> they didn't know the difference between Satchel Page and Leroy Page. You know, so <laughs> tell me who Fleetwood Walker is. Moses Fleetwood Walker. Uh, most people think Jackie Robinson is the first African American to play in the major leagues. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was Fleetwood Walker back in the 1880s. He played for the Toledo team who were in the American Association and at that time they were considered the major leagues. Uh, what's interesting about that, you can ask students all over the country who was Moses Fleetwood Walker and they wouldn't know. But I had the great pleasure of going to speak in Ohio probably about five miles from his home and I spoke at a high school and it was uh, maybe 500 students. And I asked a question about Moses Fleetwood Walker, and I had never seen so many people who knew the answer. And they were young kids, they? but they live right in that area in Ohio. Uh, so they knew. Oh, they, yeah, and the history has isn't, been kept alive. Isn't that? Well, and that's what you do, is keep the history yeah. alive. Um, I didn't know this until I read Reading Up Again, that the Monarchs had sort of an informal farm team. Yes, yes. What, what they would do is, um, make associations with other teams. So like in the early 20s, the Gilkerson Union Giants, they were a barnstorming team. And uh, they traveled through Iowa, Minnesota, North Dakota, they go into Canada. 
and uh, Gilkerson uh, was the uh, owner of that team. And so the Monarchs, if they had a guy that just looked like he was good enough, you know, and but not ready, they would send him out to the Gilkerson Union Giants. And then later on, uh, actually around 22, 23, he had the All Nations, so he operated the Monarchs and the All Nations. And uh, and then later on, he had teams like the Shreveport Acme Giants. <laughs> and the reason why these guys would form this relationship with the Monarchs, first of all, they're barnstorming teams. The Monarchs know all the good stops. Okay. So Tom Baird or J.L. Wilkinson now can help your team get booked, and you can develop our players. So everybody so it was a money, came, it was came, a money out, came out a little ahead. There. Oh, it did, definitely. I definitely. It was a good working relationship. and. Uh, they had these relationships. Uh, matter of fact, they even had a second team up to 1951-52, and um, James Koo Papa Bell was the manager of one of those years. Now he was also a player too. Yeah, he was a player. He was getting old by then because you know he started around 1922 as a pitcher, mm -hmm. and uh, you know he's known as the uh, fastest baseball player that ever ever lived. And they you know they tell the story about he could turn the lights off and get in the bed before the room got dark. That was a <laughs> Satchel Paige story about James Coop Papa Bell. So, um, but he was an outstanding individual as well uh, from St. Louis. Well, you know, I had the pleasure of interviewing Buck O'Neill, and he was talking about Jackie Robinson integrating black baseball. And he was talking about Sunday at the Monarchs baseball games, and mm -hmm. he said everybody came in their Sunday best, and all the black merchants, this is in Kansas City, all the black merchants around were open, and people did their shopping, and it was a, it was a, a, a really happy event. And he mm -hmm. said when baseball was integrated, that all went away. But he said he was always, he was a wonderful man, and he said, but it had to happen. And he raised up his finger and he looked at me, he <laughs> said it had to happen, it had to happen. Well, if you, if you really look at baseball history, it, it should have never been segregated. No, it shouldn't. And uh, no. so um, baseball today is a game that is more like the game they should have seen back then. And, and you know, one thing that I always do when I go to small towns, I always uh, tell the people that you need to recognize the people in your town who bought these black teams into your town because they saw something in diversity mm -hmm. even back then. Yeah, they and did. they knew that they were a draw and they could play those teams and it became uh, one of the, usually the largest gate of the entire season. Well, you know, the National Baseball Hall of Fame does have some um, monarchs in there. They have Ernie Banks and Willard Brown and Andy Cooper and Satchel Paige and Jackie Robinson and Bullet Rogan. Mm -hmm. And it was Bullet Rogan that pitched those, pitched those fastballs and Hilton Smith and J.L. Wilkinson. And Brown and Page and Smith and Wilkinson had their Monarchs uh, hats on ah. in their picture. And, uh, but Satchel Page isn't there. Uh, you know what's interesting, I uh, uh, was honored to have interviewed Hilton Smith, uh -huh. knew him, and uh, also Willard Brown. Did you? Yeah, Willard knew Willard Brown as well. And uh, Willard Brown, the funny thing that I, I remember about Willard Brown, you know, he played, he came up to the Monarchs in the 30, 35, 1935, uh -huh, uh -huh. and he finished up in, um, in the Mandak League in Canada, uh -huh. and it's the late 1950s, and he always told me, he said, you know, if I had got some glasses, I probably could have played a few more years. He just, he just thought that he couldn't see anymore, and he didn't want to wear glasses, so, but, uh, he was a great player, and I happen to think, you know, they talk about Josh Gibson and what a great home run hitter he is. I do believe that Willard Brown hit more home runs than Josh Gibson, and one day I'm gonna prove it. <laughs> By golly, I think that's <laughs> terrific. I have, there are lots of good stories. I, I, another one that, that Buck O'Neill told me, when he, he's from Florida, and he said he was a tall, skinny kid, and all of his friends called him Foots because mm -hmm. he was so tall and skinny and he had such big feet. And he said, I played baseball because that was all we had to do. So all the kids in the neighborhood played baseball. That's right, that's right. But they called him Foots, which I thought was really very, have I forgot, don't you know any interesting stories that I've forgotten? I mean, there are some wonderful stories about these people. Oh my goodness. Who, what, have I forgotten any that we ought to relate to well, these good folks? Well, you know, uh, one thing that uh, you might want to mention is, uh, uh, for instance, Jackie Robinson, he was stolen from the Kansas City Monarchs. 
And so the Brooklyn Dodgers didn't pay him anything, pay the Monarchs anything to get Jackie. And you know, Tom Baird and J.L. Wilkinson, who were the partners of owning the Monarchs, they were going to sue the Brooklyn Dodgers. And then they decided that, you know, well, it wouldn't be wise to sue because you got two white guys owning a black team. Then they're going to say you're trying to hold the black guy back. So uh, they didn't sue. And they sent, gave Jackie their blessing. And, uh, and then the Monarchs go on to send 17 players to the major leagues, and which includes some people like Ernie Banks, Bo Mason, um, Elston Howard, you know, Kirk Roberts. We can go on and on and on. And uh, how many of you think they sent to the Brooklyn Dodgers? None. N none. So the Brooklyn Dodgers, by getting Jackie, they missed out on a lot of good talent. They did. Finally, they got a poke in the eye, didn't they? they? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite player, if you <coughs> had to choose one? Bullet Rogan. Bullet Rogan, Bullet why? Rogan. Bullet Rogan. He comes from my hometown, first of all, Kansas City, Kansas. Uh -huh. And I happen to believe that he is the greatest all-around baseball player that ever lived. That means he could hit and pitch. And then what most people, contemporaries, they're going to say it's Babe Ruth. And, and I always like to compare Bullet Rogan to Babe Ruth, uh, like Rogan won over 400 games. Uh, he struck out over 3,000 men. Uh, in addition, that he invented a pitch called the change, it's called his palm ball, that he used to change of pace. In addition to that, he hit for 300 and he hit for power. Many times, he would hit a home run, pitch a shutout, and practically win his own game. And then I tell all these accolades, and for instance, he was also a 10-second man, which means he could run the 100-yard dash in less than 10 seconds. Now, we know Babe Ruth couldn't do that, right? And uh, the other thing, after I name all those things, I always tell people, if that's not enough for you, how about this? He also drove the bus. Can you believe that? <laughs> Were these tall, big, you know, the b baseball players today are really big men. Oh, no. Were these big fellas? Oh, Bullet Rogan. Uh, was five foot seven. Uh, Eddie Dwight, Monarch center fielder, um, whose son goes on to be the first astronaut in the NASA program, first black astronaut in the NASA program. And his uh, father was a monarch. Yeah, and he was five foot two. His father was five foot two. His son was five foot two or three. Oh. So yeah. Now these were these were smaller guys, and uh, you know, uh, people as a whole, of course, were smaller then. So, but if you get somebody who was like Satchel Page. You know, they're going to be 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, that was considered a big man. Yeah, he was a tall then. guy, yeah, yeah. yeah. But always skinny. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And I always had that arm. Boy, he I'll could tell you. Throw. You just wonder, I mean, that he didn't, it didn't fall off. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he did hurt his arm uh, in the late 1930s, and they thought he was through. But J.L. Wilkinson and Tom Baird gave him another chance, and they put him with the Monarchs' second team, and they went to took the second team out to like uh, places like in Nevada and Wyoming, mm -hmm. and he's way off the beaten track, and his arm comes back. Oh, goodness. And the rest is history. It's history. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so as I say, thank you so much, Bill Dixon. What a wonderful conversation. I have to quote you again, and you said, it's not just black baseball. It's all ethnicities, and the great game of baseball includes everyone. So let's continue to take ourselves out to the ball game. Thanks, Phil. Thank you so much. Thank you, and it's been so nice to have you. Come again.